Warning, if you or someone you know is considering committing suicide, please call this number on the screen right now. Ding dong YouTube, welcome back to the channel. I'm the Jobless Coder, and there is a national crisis facing post-secondary students, and that is suicide on university campuses. Temporary safety barriers blocking certain parts of the staircase. 81% said academic pressure is a major cause of mental illness. Tragedy is fueling this movement. Victoria Liao barely made it out of school alive. The university remains tight-lipped on what happened. Please make it easier for someone to get material help here. Some, like UBC's president, admit it can become so serious they've actually considered suicide. I tried to kill myself twice, once at the age of 14 and once in my late 20s. Suicide is merely a front to the larger problem at hand. The unethical deterrence of discussing the subject of suicide and the blatant discrimination of those who do. In September of 2019, Nerd City released a video on his channel discussing the discovery of the now infamous word list of YouTube demonetization. Any video which contains these words in their title or description, or if the computer algorithm determines the word in the subtitles to the script of the video, you will be demonetized. At the time of making this video, this video and this channel are not currently monetized, but if they were, and when I am, this this video will be deemed non-advertiser friendly because of the content I discuss. The word suicide is on this list. For obvious reasons, nobody wants to log into their YouTube account in the morning to find the channel they're subscribed to having uploaded a live video of somebody committing suicide. But this is a double-edged sword which prevents anyone such as myself or other content creators from making topics around this subject. How is it right? How is it fair that content creators should be dissuaded from making a subject on this topic over fear of financial loss or receiving a community strike on their channel, even if a video like this is the exact thing a person needs to see to prevent them from committing suicide? I am very open about my personal feelings and I have posted about suicide in the past to various social media accounts such as Facebook, but never because I had an action or a plan to action to commit suicide. But having done so, and continuing to do so, provide the very catalyst to the seeds which will eventually lead a person to doing so. Further to that, I can personally guarantee you that anyone conducting a background check on myself or yourself for the purpose of employment who finds certain things in my social media such as posts on Facebook about suicide or they find this video, I will not be considered for a position for this job at this company because of my openness about suicide. And if you are an employer right now conducting a background check on me for some job that I have applied for and you determine that because of this video, that because of the things that I have openly said on Facebook, that I am unhirable, fuck you! Because I would rather be open and honest about my feelings and alive because of that than dead because I kept the feelings bottled up inside me until I couldn't take it anymore and then I jumped in front of a car! And at my funeral, everyone will ask, Oh, how could he have done such an egregious thing? He was such a happy and fun-loving child. I can't believe he would take his own life. And it's because no one will understand how I feel inside. How is a person supposed to get the help, the treatment that they need to prevent them from committing suicide if they can't openly talk about it without fear of further damaging their life and leading to the very causes that cause them to commit suicide? I believe the majority of the reluctance to discuss this subject comes down to fear, and fear at its heart is essentially irrational. Many people are afraid of many things, snakes, spiders, fear of the dark, 
And it's all because of lack of knowledge. The more you know about snakes, the less afraid you are. The more you know about spiders, the less afraid of them you are. The more you understand that dark is merely the absence of light and it has absolutely nothing to do with danger, the less afraid of the dark a person becomes. That is because they understand the fundamentals of these subjects that cause them to be afraid. And that is the very reason that suicide is considered such a taboo subject because of fear. Because people don't understand it and they don't understand those who commit it. And when a person is driven to the very edge of suicide, they're often left with two choices ahead of them. The first is taking their own life in solitude. They find a bathtub and they slit their wrists and they drown in it. They hung themselves from the roof. They take some kind of deadly poison and they go out quietly in the middle of the night with no one beside them. The second alternative option is to go out in a blaze of chaos and fury. These are the people who grab guns and go and shoot up schools only to then blow their own brains out. These are the people who go to shopping malls on Boxing Day and go and shoot a bunch of people only to blow their brains out. These are the people who steal a tank and use it to drive over civilians in the street before they are eventually gunned down by the police. They don't realize that there's a third option on the table, and that is to discuss their suicidal tendencies. That is to seek help for it. But in many cases, they're unable to because society has deemed that inappropriate. They get judged. They get ostracized. It comes with consequences. And often those consequences put them in a worse situation that leads to even further destruction that leads to suicide. And if you deem that I am not worthy for a job at your company, I don't want to work for your retarded company anyways. Fuck you. I'll make my own damn company. I am open and honest about my suicide because I want you to understand that if you are watching this video and you're considering suicide yourself, you are not alone. And I want to seek help for it and I want you to seek help for it. But in many cases, you won't be able to because the moment you mention suicide, you think they're going to lock you in an insane asylum. Well, that's not true. But I want you to understand that it does come with serious consequences. If you're currently in a relationship or you're married with someone, there's a very high chance of probability that if you talk about your suicidal desire because you want to seek help for it, your significant other may break up with you. Your spouse might divorce you. Your friends may ostracize themselves from you and your parents may no longer want you in their house. You may be suspended or expelled from your school. You could be fired from your job or deemed unworthy for the job you're applying to. And it is these very things that back you into a corner of isolation. You have no one to talk to because everyone has abandoned you. And what other option are you left with at that point? But to commit suicide. And in many cases, suicide or grabbing a gun and causing a militia in the street is the result of a mental health crisis that needs to be addressed. And it cannot be addressed as long as there is secrecy about the subject. If you have seen the movie The Joker, which came out last year, it depicts the life of Arthur Fleck. A man who suffers serious mental health problems and has been abandoned by his fellow men because of their fear they have for him. <laughs> or because he's weird or different or unusual. And it is that very abandonment that leads him to becoming the Joker, a mass murdering maniac. He had hopes, he had dreams, he had a desire to live a life of perpetuity. And if you watch the movie, you can't help but feel sorry for him and understand the justification for why he shoots his idol in the face at the end of the movie. His entire life, everyone shit down his throat and pushed him away, and treated him like garbage, and then you wonder why he turns into a mass murdering maniac. And when the movie released, there was a lot of controversy in the news that it would basically glorify going on mass murdering sprees. But I think there's a deeper message behind the movie. A message of mental health crisis. Because you need to understand the mindset of what happens when you take a person who has hopes and dreams and desires to be something great and you kick them down and you beat them down and you shit down their throat. You need to understand that that has consequence. Am I justifying what the Joker did? No. 
there is absolutely no excuse for what he did. But there is no excuse either for what everyone else did in that movie to cause him to become the Joker. And there is no excuse for the children who grab guns and go and shoot their fellow classmate because they were bullied their whole life. But there is also no excuse for the bullies to bully that person their entire life. That is why I am open and honest about the situation of my life and the way I feel and the way I have been treated my entire life because I cannot receive help unless I am honest. And in doing so, my honesty has cost me greatly. And I want you to understand that you need to seek help too. But doing so will cause consequences in your life and it will push you away from those who can help you the most. I want to show you exactly what it is that I am talking about because I went to university for three years and it was in the third year of university that I was pushed to the breaking point of mentality that I was driven to suicide. There are many reasons in my third year of university that led me to dropping out of school. I do plan on making a video at some point in the future about all of the specifics why I dropped out of school and what led me to that decision, but for now I will cover just a few of the basic main points that led to my suicidal desire in the second semester of my third year of university for a computer science program at the University of Lethbridge. That fall of 2017 didn't begin very nice. I was coming off of one of the most traumatizing summers of my life. Being unable to get a job anywhere in the city, I turned to online freelancing and fell the victim of a job scam, which nearly cost me 2300 US dollars and severely fucked with my psyche. Dealing with the pressure and the stress from that drove me to my breaking point. That is how my third year of university began. In September, my bike lock broke, and because my backyard was open to the public, my bike was eventually stolen. In October, the ignition to my vehicle stopped working, and I took it to a repair garage downtown. At the time, I had about $50 worth of cans and bottles in the back of my vehicle, which I planned to use towards money to buy Christmas presents for my family. While my vehicle was parked at the garage downtown Lethbridge, it was broken into and those bottles and cans were stolen. I did not have any money left for any Christmas presents for my family that year. That in itself, mounted with the increasing pressure of an increasing course load, would be enough to cause somebody to rip their hair out. But that was merely the icing on the cake. If you are currently in university, or you have ever gone to university, you will understand that the syllabus is law. And if it's not in the syllabus, it is not law. That fall, I fought one of my professors vigorously who refused to mark an assignment of mine that was worth 20% because I did not submit it in the mannerism in which he wanted, but was never outlined in the syllabus. I slid my assignment under his office door, but he wanted it to be put in some slot in some submission tray down the hallway. And because of that, he refused to mark it. The syllabus had absolutely zero information in it regarding the exact mannerism under which an assignment should be submitted. And because of this reason, I decided to fight him to the fullest extent that I could. I talked with many of my peers regarding this and a few teachers and they all agreed that I had a very good case on my hands to get my assignment marked. I underwent all of the proper protocol, I met with the proper people to make this happen, but at the end of the day I had a meeting between myself, the dean, and this professor where I was essentially told that the professor is the professor and he can do whatever the fuck he wants and he doesn't have to mark my assignment if he doesn't want to. Naturally, I was outraged over this, and ill-advised under the rage I was ensuing, I sent a very ruthless, a very nasty email to this professor. I understood what it was that I was writing, I understood what it was that I was saying, I understood that it came with consequences. And subsequently, I was reprimanded for the vulgarity I had used against my professor. But I didn't care. As a result of that email, a meeting between myself, the dean, and the professor was scheduled for January 10th of 2018. The consequences of that meeting were that I had to apologize to the professor in person, I had to write him an apology letter, and I received a strike on my university account. I was told at that point by the dean that I should seek out counseling from the mental health office, which I found very offensive considering I was already seeking help from a counselor. I've been in and out of counseling since I was six years old and the dean did not care two shits to do her research into my file to see that I was already meeting with the counselor every two weeks and a doctor every month and I was on medication too that was doing me jack shit. 
That to me felt like a blatant disregard of my situation and a mere dismissal of the problems that I needed help with because there was nothing better she could have suggested than to seek help from a counselor. And I understand that in the actions I take by verbalizing and making publicly known my feelings and my desires and my suicidal tendencies, that there may not be somebody out there who is either able or willing to help me fix my situation. But what I do know is that by keeping quiet and keeping everything bottled up inside me, no one can help me if they don't know what's going on. At that point in time, I was looking ahead to the summer of that year, the summer of 2018. As it stands, the University of Lethbridge has a yearly co-op program set up with EA Games at the Burnaby campus. You must wait until your third year of university to apply. Not only was I in my third year of university getting reasonably okay grades, but I also had prior experience with game jams and having done several mobile apps in my free time. So I felt a shoe in for a role working for EA Games. In February of that year, I applied to 15 different positions for the company, and I was rejected from every single one of them. When I spoke with my co-op advisor on this rejection, she told me there was not a single other student in the computer science program at the University of Lethbridge who was granted an interview that year. I felt worthless. I felt like garbage. I felt like giving up at the thought that I was yet again facing another summer without employment and more job scams. And if that wasn't hard enough to deal with, I was already facing the fact that I was going to be losing yet another roommate come that summer. I suffer a severely dehabilitating mental illness called OCD. I wash for hours in the bathroom and it causes a great deal of mess on the counter and the floor. I wear latex gloves, that's why I'm weird. And for a great many other reasons involving cleaning with harsh chemicals such as bleach, I could not keep a roommate to save my life. The previous year, my best friend in university was my roommate, and it nearly destroyed our friendship. In that year, I was already facing the loss of yet another roommate who was a very close friend of mine. As the years progressed throughout university, my cleaning tendencies got worse. In the summer of 2016, I had an episode of psychosis where I went on a cleaning rampage of the house my parents had just bought me to move in. I spent nearly $3,000 in cleaning supplies and spent every last waking minute of my day cleaning that house. Everything built and accumulated to the point I eventually ended up passed out in the backyard for three hours and I nearly coughed myself into a coma because I was choking to death on bleach. I have suffered from this severe of OCD since 2013, and ever since I have wanted to die because it has destroyed every aspect of my life and has nearly ripped my family apart. I thought there might be a solution to the problem, but there is none. OCD is incurable, and there is no amount of medication or drugs you can pump me full of that will fix the problem. My mental illness causes me to do things that normal people consider very bizarre and make no sense at all. For instance, in the dead of Canadian winter, I will go outside and choose not to wear a jacket because I would rather suffer the momentary feeling of freezing to death than have to deal with more laundry. And so in February of 2018, I had planned a stargazing night with the university club that I was running at the time. That night was a major snowstorm, and everyone decided against it otherwise. Everyone except myself. I made my way down to the observatory without a jacket as I typically did, and I did not have a cell phone at the time either. My van got stuck in two and a half feet of snow six kilometers outside the city, and I didn't have a cell phone to call for help. Out of sheer desperation, I was driven to walk from the top entrance of the observatory a kilometer and a half away down to the bottom of the river in the freezing frigid temperatures without a jacket. I arrived at the bottom of the hill, I discovered the entire place was locked up and no one was there. None of the amateur astronomy members were at the observatory. I had been outside now for almost two hours without a jacket and I was starting to freeze to death. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to call for help, and the only thing I could think of was to mash the buttons on the security lock of the door in hopes the police would eventually arrive. I made my way back up the hill to my van which took nearly an hour. When I arrived in my vehicle, sure enough, there was a police car there as well as somebody else who had arrived to help. I used the cell phone of the police officer to phone AMA and had to wait for a tow truck to arrive. It took nearly two hours for that tow truck to arrive to pull my van out of the snow. The entire time, I burnt through half a tank of gas just to keep the heater on. I was exhausted, I was upset, I felt like shit. 
Two days later, my vehicle got stuck in a mountain of snow trying to exit my property and head to the grocery store. And I had to wait yet again for a tow truck to arrive and dig my vehicle out. If you have ever been to Alberta or you've ever lived in central Alberta, you will know that winter is absolute hell. I hate it here. It sucks. You get four feet of snow overnight and nobody can drive their vehicles because the streets aren't plowed. It's bullshit. It was at that point, at that specific point, under the mountain of months of built up and sustained stress that I was under, that I snapped. And when I snapped, I wrote this Facebook post.